Buenos dias once again, and thank you to all of you who've joined us since we began our plenary. Friends, I'm thrilled to be back here to introduce this very special conversation that I'm sure you've all been eagerly anticipating. And I'm not going to waste any more time with lengthy, lengthy introductions, as I'm sure you all want to hear from our guests, not from me. So first, it's my pleasure to introduce an extraordinary leader whom I've been lucky enough to work with on a regular basis over the last two years and from whom I've learned a great deal. Please welcome the distinguished representative from California's 44th Congressional District and the CHCI Chairwoman, the Honorable Nanette Diaz Barragan. And now, it is my distinct honor to introduce another leader who has been a true ally and a champion who has fought day in and day out to provide a more equitable future for the Latino community and for all Americans from her earliest days as a public official in California. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Bienvenidos. Bienvenidos a toda mi gente Latina. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. Madam Vice President, what an honor it is to be here with you today and to have you here as part of CHCI Week to uh, share with us and talk to us today about um, what you've been hearing across the country. Um, but before we do that, I want to just take a moment to recognize everything um, that you have done and continue to do. You have been a staunch ally for Latinos and Latinas across our country from your days as Attorney General of California um, to your time as Senator fighting for dreamers and essential workers and DACA recipients to your time as Vice President. And one of the things people may not know about is her work on water issues and your work on environmental justice, yeah. something that's near and dear to me. And so thank you for that. We don't hear too often or enough about you and your work and everything you do for us. So thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a, quite an honor to have another Californian <laughs> here at the table. And uh, just uh, last year, we brought together uh, with your leadership uh, Latina entrepreneurs to hear yeah. about their stories and their yeah. struggles. Yeah. Um, and that was unprecedented before. Mm -hmm. And just another symbol and another action of her commitment to our communities and to everything you're doing for us. And so um, I want to just say thank you. Um, you have been somebody for the people, para la gente, para nuestra gente, nuestra comunidad. So thank you for that. And, uh, you know, before we get... Uh, started, you know, this is um, CHCI week. The theme is rooted in strength, achieving your achieving our dream. Yeah. And so there's nobody more fitting than that to, to have you here on stage uh, taking questions. And my first question is actually not part of what we were going to talk about, but I think it's so important. I think about, you know, Latino heritage and my mom, and I remember she used to make tamales for Christmas. <laughs> and my mother's older now. She doesn't have that ability to do. But the first question for you is, what do you like to cook? <laughs> I love to cook. I love to cook. And I come from a family of good cooks. And probably most of the most important conversations that ever took place in my family intergenerationally took place in the kitchen. Um, so I was sharing with the Congresswoman, and I first of all, I just want to say thank you for your leadership, because I have watched you up close fighting every day for the people of your district, the people of California, and nationally. And we have an extraordinary national leader in Nanette Barragan, and I want to thank you for what you do every day, truly, truly. 
Um, so I love to cook. I love to cook many things. I mean, you know, my go-to is a roast chicken, but I was sharing with, with you backstage that, because um, you were talking about tamales, and every Christmas I, we had a tradition, my mother passed away years ago, but of, um, I, I make chili relleno, my mother's chili relleno recipe every Christmas morning. Uh, it's, it's our family tradition, so that is one of my favorite things to cook, Well, too. I'll have to get invited someday <laughs> to try out the chile relleno. Oh, and, I oh, wait, love and, chile relleno. So. And let me, wait, let me just tell you something else. So I live in the official residence of the vice president, right? So we have, um, we, there's a little garden there, and I have been planting, and I know I'm the first vice president of the United States to do this, Chili peppers. <laughs> no, like a whole selection. I have habanero, I have scotch bonnet, I have Thai chili peppers. I'm growing all these chili peppers in the, in the garden at the vice president's res residence. And so I guess, you know, um, it matters where you come from to know what you want. <laughs> oh boy, that's heartburn for me. <laughs> okay, well, Madam Vice President, uh, this is a historic moment. Uh, we're sitting here um, you're the first black woman vice president, and your example means something to others. So I want to start there. Yeah. Um, you serving in your role as vice president is historic and represents many firsts for our country. What do you say to young leaders, yeah. Latinos, Latinas, who are listening about your experience thus far and what your advice for them as they follow in your footsteps and break barriers of their own? So my mother uh, had a lot of advice for us, my sister Maya and me growing up, and one of them she would say to me, Kamala, you may be the first to do many things. Make sure you're not the last. So I'm going to ask the, this group of leaders, raise your hand if you are the first in your family or the first in your community to do something. Exactly. Make sure you're not the last. That's the responsibility that we each carry, and it is a huge responsibility. Because we know that when we chart that course, and if for our family, our community, um, it was the first time that a member of the family or the community saw it, they applaud it, and they look to you then for an additional level of leadership in addition to the thing that you are charting in terms of the work. You then represent so much about the possibility that each of us has and was born with. And that's, that's a burden to carry, no doubt. Because with it comes the responsibility of inspiring people to see what they've not seen before. With it comes the responsibility to inspire people to have a sense of vision about what can be unburdened by what has been. And everything that you do in charting that course will make a difference in the lives of people you will never meet, people who may never even know your name, but will have a lasting impression, not just on people that look like you, but all people because it expands their ability to understand what is possible. And so I say then, I was speaking with the interns, um, the CHCI interns and the fellows, and I'm gonna, they just heard what I said, but I'm gonna share it for everybody else. Many times, most of us have had this experience. You will walk into a room, a meeting room, a boardroom, and you will be the only person that looks like you or has had your life experience. Never walk into that room feeling alone. Know that when you walk into that room, we all walk into that room with you. And so chin up, shoulders back, because you carry the voices of so many people who are proud you are in that room and expect Here's the point about the responsibility, that you will then carry their voice and own your authority to use that voice that will invariably improve the discourse and the decisions that are being made in that room. 
But know every time you are not there alone, we are all there with you. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you for reminding us about that. And, you know, it reminds me that you have been on the road a lot. Yes. And out and about, and it's great to see you on the road because people want to see you out there. And I've seen your interaction with our leaders and our children, and it's really quite remarkable. You've been meeting with communities, Latino communities, and business owners, and union members, yeah. and leaders. What are the common themes in terms of what people are feeling and what they're sharing with you? So we are 56 days before the midterms. And um, I'm going to then put my comments in, in the context of just the reality of the moment, which includes we are 56 days from the midterms. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so what the conversations that I'm having include this. Being with a group of people who stood in line for hours in 2020, whichever group that may be, small business owners, Latina business owners, like you said, families, parents with young children, seniors. Uh, and the conversation is, includes, thank you, because you stood in line for hours. We had the largest turnout in a very long term in terms of a, 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 an election, including the largest number of young voters. And when you stood in line, you were standing in line to put in your order. You said, deal with child poverty in America and support families. And so we, our administration, was able to extend the child tax credit, which reduced child poverty in America by 40% in the first year. We talk about <laughs> the fact that families said, and in particular parents or those parenting a child, the cost of the expenses associated with raising a child are overwhelming. So we passed a tax cut for people who are parenting children of up to $8,000 for the cost of food, of medicine, of school supplies. We talked with seniors who said it is outrageous that we are going bankrupt, are choosing whether we will have our medication or pay rent, fulfill our, our prescription, or buy food, and in particular when we have diabetes. And so we got in this last bill, thanks to your leadership, that there's gonna be a $35 cap on insulin per month. <laughs> 70, and, and Latinos are 70% more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes. Absolutely. These are the conversations we have. We have a conversation about the fact that broadband, high-speed internet, we know that for so many of our poor communities, communities of color, especially during the height of the pandemic, the fractures and fissures and failures of the system were highlighted, including the disparity and the inequity around who has access, racially, the inequity, poverty, the inequity around who has access to high-speed internet, which means whether your child is gonna stay caught up with their studies, whether a senior can have access to telemedicine, whether a small business can have access to their clients. And because you stood in line for four or five hours, we now are in the process of ensuring that everyone has affordable and accessible high-speed internet, including bringing the cost down $30 off a month and a $100 voucher to help pay for a tablet. These are the things that people asked for and they wanna know their government is responsive. And I will say that I think it's very important when we go to folks and ask them to vote in 56 days that we should expect they're gonna ask a righteous question, which is why should I vote? That is a righteous question. And it is important for us to explain why. Because when we look at what is happening with a court, and I know we're gonna talk about this, I believe, yes. mm -hmm. the United States Supreme Court, the highest court in the land that just took a constitutional right that had been recognized from the people of America, from the women of America, when we look at laws that are being passed around the country that are an attack on voting rights, an attack on a woman's reproductive health rights, an attack on LGBTQ rights, we know there's still so much work to do. And that's part of what I'm also talking with people about. Right. Because they wanna know 
that we are in the fight. Well, you have been we in the are. fight. Thank you for that. <laughs> and thank you for fighting for our Latino communities. <laughs> Latinos have a high incident of diabetes, as you mentioned. Yeah. My district has the highest in the state of California. Mm -hmm. And so the work that you and the administration have done has just been something that is far needed in our, in our communities. And you mentioned and touched on this um, this last question I want to ask you, because I, um, I know we're a little short on time, is you know you have been a champion um, to make sure our community health centers have yeah. the funding that they need, something that is uh, prominent in our Latino communities where yeah. people who are underinsured or uh, don't have insurance go to. Yeah, that's right. Um, but but the Dobbs decision yeah. and this this assault on women and women's reproductive rights. Yeah. You have been a champion and a leader on this, leading the effort, going around the country, talking to Latinas yeah. and those um, at the yeah. table. You've met with over 150 legislators since Dobbs' decision. It seems it has settled in for many, the real impact that the court's uh, decision. What insights can you share from your conversations and where do we go from here? So, again, the, it, it is absolutely, it was unthinkable that the United States Supreme Court, the highest court in our land, would take a right that had been recognized, but they did. And what I'm talking with folks about, and I've been convening state legislators around the country in so-called red states and blue states, is what we need to do to stand up um, for the rights of women and the people who care about them to make decisions about their own body. It's so fundamental. Like, let's take back the flag on this. This literally is about freedom. This is about autonomy. This is about self-determination. And an important point to be made to all communities is this. You don't have to abandon your faith or your beliefs to agree the government should not be making this decision for women. And you know, I think about it in many contexts, including this Congresswoman. Uh, I've now, as Vice President, met with, in person or by phone, with 100 world leaders. Presidents, prime ministers, kings, chancellors. And the thing about who we are as a country, as Americans, as the United States, is we have been able to walk in these rooms with confidence talking about the importance of democracies, talking about the importance of rule of law, human rights, we have held ourselves out to be a role model of all of those things, which gives us then some legitimacy, dare I say authority, to then talk about human rights around the world, talk about the importance of rule of law around the world. Well, as we all know, because this is a room full of role models, when you are a role model, people watch what you do to see if it matches up to what you say. So nations around the world are watching this and saying, what's going on there? Do they really stand for democracy? Do they really have a legitimate ability to tell other countries what to do? And there's an additional nuance to this. Authoritarian countries can now say, that great democracy is taking these rights. Why can't we also? The stakes are so high on these issues. This issue of reproductive rights for women, voting rights, and so many other things. And so I say to this group of leaders, we have a charge. Being in the positions we are in at this moment in time in the history of our country and our world. And it is more than a notion that we must stand for our democracy and the founding principles of our nation 
which include the importance of freedoms and liberty, not to mention equality and justice. So much is at stake right now. And I look at this gathering of extraordinary leaders, and I know we're up for it, but there's a lot at stake, and there are a lot of people counting on us right now to use our voice. Well, thank you for reminding us what is at stake. Because this conference, as I mentioned, is called Rooted in Strength, Achieving Our Dream. We have so many who come to this country to achieve the American dream. And your story is the American dream. Your parents who immigrated here, mm -hmm. and now you, know, you serving as vice president is extraordinary. Well, so and, and to your point, my mother arrived in the United States at the age of 19 from India by herself. And I'm vice president of the United States. That is a statement about who our country is. So let's fight for that. Thank you, Madam Vice President, for being with us here today. Let's Thank give you. her a round of applause. Thank you.